Hey everybody, welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. Before we go over to Garrett's 10 seconds, if you didn't catch this already, Binged is now a weekly podcast. So we are dropping episodes every single week over there. So if you want to check it out again, that's just my solo podcast, Binged. I know you will love it if you haven't listened already. And if you do listen right now, thank you. I love you so much. Okay, now we can do your 10 seconds. Well, I got a ton of suggestions for TV shows. Now I'm going to slowly start going through them. Didn't you say you started one? I did start one. Secession? Is that what it's called? Um, I started that. It's been, you know, just getting through it, trying to get into it. It's been okay so far. So I, I, get, I didn't, like, look up what it was supposed to be about. So I was, like, a little confused at first. Mm-hmm. But I'm starting to understand a little bit more now. So that's been good so far. There's there's a ton. I got, I don't know, I feel like there's probably like 500 different TV shows. So I'm excited to go through those. And the other day I was sitting down and I was thinking about, you know, how cool would it be just to buy a branch or house just in the middle of nowhere and just live off your land and homestead? Yeah, like it sounds cool in theory. I mean, I know I probably could never, I could never do it. Well, people were telling you to watch Yellowstone. Does oh, that have I've anything I've to se- do yeah. with this? I mean, I've seen Yellowstone. Yellowstone's really good if you haven't seen it. Have you seen you wouldn't you haven't seen it? Mm-mm. I tried to get Peyton to watch it with me and I know she would like it, but she hasn't seen it. It's a really good show. But Peyton's talked about we've talked about Homestead, both of us before. It just seems like in theory it'd be like, All right, I'm gonna move to the middle of <laughs> Montana. I'm gonna buy a house. I'm gonna grow my own food. Ride around on a horse. Yeah. I I know I couldn't do it, but. It it's hilarious fun. because the only time Garrett and I can eat at home is if we're cooking our HelloFresh. Mm, true. So how are we going to go from that to homesteading? I don't know. We're just bad cooks. Like, so, okay. So we grow, our, we grow all of our own food. We have meat. We have, you know, whatever it is. We start cooking it. And, and then, then we DoorDash McDonald's. And then it turns out bad. Well, there's gonna not gonna be McDonald's. What I'm oh, trying yeah. to say we're in the middle oh, of nowhere. Yeah. Well, we forced. Yes, yeah, so we're forced to eat whatever we make. That sounds like awful. I know, I know. That's what I was thinking about. So it's like, okay, well, let's go to X, Y, and Z today. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The nearest store next to you is an hour and a half away. I don't know. It's definitely hard because it sounds nice, okay. like you're saying. I got theory. an example for you. This is very. This is a very city boy type of comment. So, for example, Peyton is from Idaho, a small town in Idaho. Um, there's no cheesecake factory. Oh, you know what I'm gosh. saying? There is no cheesecake factory in Idaho. <laughs> is there one in Idaho? Do you know? I don't know. Like in a different part? Maybe. Boise? Okay. I guess what I'm trying to say is the nearest cheesecake factory is probably like three, four hours away. It's just hard. Some people's talents are to be so just homemaker and cook and do all that stuff and it's we are just not talented at it every time we try we end up just having to go get mcdonald's i know it sounds bad but maybe if i had like a little more free time you think you would go to cook i maybe i would not i don't enjoy it yeah i know i know it's and i don't blame you i don't i mean it doesn't bother me but anyway, so I guess what I'm trying to say, if there is no cheesecake factory within two hours of where you two. live, an hour of there where you, you live, I won't live there. <laughs> so if you know any places where I can. It's those fried mac and cheese balls. <laughs> those freaking fried mac and cheese balls. I'm telling you. macaroni balls. Or those things are. Garrett loves chef's those. kiss. <laughs> uh, anyways, I could probably rant. For a long time about this. Cheesecake, sponsor me. That's your that's who you pick? That's my next goal is Cheesecake Factory. So if anyone here works at Cheesecake Factory, you don't even pay me. Just help me get free fried macaroni and cheese balls every single time I go. That's so funny. All right. Well, that was Garrett's 10 minutes. I mean, 10 seconds. And we're going to jump into our case sources. This week, they are NBCWashington.com, WashingtonPost.com, Newsweek.com, WTOP.com, WUSA9.com, CBS News, Fox 5 DC, LinkedIn, Crime Online, Daily Mail, Fairfax County Police Department News, FairfaxTimes.com, and Oxygen.com.
Okay, so murder suicides are a complicated and tragic occurrence that don't often get the kind of media attention that other types of murderers do. People often think that a murder suicide happens only in other families and that it could not possibly happen in their own family. However, according to a recent article in Newsweek, these tragedies are not as rare as Americans might think. In 2017, which is when our case took place, there were over 600 murder-suicide incidents in Whoa. the United States. Okay. The vast majority of these murder-suicide cases are committed with a firearm by a man, often in conjunction with an escalating pattern of domestic violence. So today we're going to Virginia, which is home to the Hargan family. Now, Pamela Hargan, originally Pamela Denise Hansen, grew up in a small town in Illinois, far from any notions of violence. And there probably wasn't a cheesecake factory there. Mm -hmm. Ambitious and career minded, Pamela or Pam, as she went by, left her small town Midwest roots and moved to the East Coast, where she attended college at the State University of New York, pursuing an undergraduate degree in business administration. Okay. She later earned her master's in executive management, human resources leadership from Rutgers University in New Jersey. So Pam worked her way up the ladder over the years and eventually attained an executive position at a major defense contractor where she worked for over 20 years and was promoted to VP of human resources and workforce strategy. Then in early 2015, she began working for a different defense contractor um, called SAIC. She began working there in Virginia, where she was again the VP of human resources. At this point, Pam married Steve Hargan, her husband at the time of our case, and she took on the name Pamela Hansen Hargan. She and her husband, Steve, had three daughters, Megan, Ashley, and Helen. Now, Pam and Steve's marriage didn't last, however, and Pam and Steve divorced when their girls were still pretty young. There was a significant age gap between the two oldest girls, Megan and Ashley, and their younger sister, Helen. Now, Megan was 11 years older and Ashley was nine years older than Helen. So they kind of had the two and then waited a little bit and had the, the last one. Now, growing up with a successful single mother, Megan and Ashley would sometimes take care of Helen, their little sister, when their mom traveled for work. So they kind of, in a sense, helped raise her. Pam and her girls moved around after the divorce, mostly because of Pam's jobs. And at one point, they live in Maryland, just outside of D.C. In addition to excelling at her jobs, Pam also does well financially, amassing a very impressive $8 million estate. Oh. She is generous with her money, especially with her three girls, whom she's very proud of. Pam buys a beautiful six-bedroom house in McLean, Virginia in 2015, right around the time that she switches that, that job and begins working for SAIC. Now, Steve, the girls' dad, is living nearby in Sterling, Virginia at the time, only 16 or 17 miles west of McLean. Now, with this arrangement, the girls can easily spend time with both of their parents. In 2017, at the age of 63, Pam is certainly starting to think about retirement, but that notion is complicated by the fact that she's still supporting at least two of her daughters as both Megan and Helen are living with her along with Megan's young daughter. So Pam still had many family and financial obligations and she's not alone at home. In 2017, Megan Hargan is 34, Ashley Hargan is 32, and Helen Hargan is 23. Helen had graduated college two years earlier in 2015 in Dallas, Texas, and she's described as driven and ambitious, though one friend says that Helen is still trying to kind of find her way in her career. I mean, she's only 23. Mm -hmm. She double majored in math and management science. She was serious. She studied a lot and even worked during college as a waitress in Texas, which technically she didn't necessarily need to do because her mom was supporting her. Yeah. So while working as a waitress, she actually meets her boyfriend, Carlos Gutierrez, and he's still living in Texas, but there's talk about an engagement and him possibly coming to Virginia as well. Now, Helen is reportedly in the midst of pursuing her master's at SMU to be earned in 2018, but her plans are a bit unclear given that she returns to Virginia in early 2017. So 
she's just graduated college and she's basically deciding, do I want to go on and get my master's or am yeah. I done? And then I'm just going to pursue a career. And again, I said that the oldest daughter, Megan, is living at home. She's married, but her husband is in the military. And so she and their seven-year-old daughter are living in the six-bedroom house in Virginia with her mom. Okay. Megan volunteers in a program to help dogs who have been rescued from war-torn countries. Apparently, her husband is living in West Virginia. It's not clear whether he ever gets deployed overseas. And they're kind of having a long distance marriage of sorts. And she is unemployed. Like I said, her mother was financially helping her. Yeah. Megan has mentioned to at least one friend that Helen, at this point in their lives in 2017, 23 year old Helen, who's living at home with her and her mom, has been depressed and is struggling. Like she's just hit that age. She's not doing very well. And then the middle daughter, Ashley, lives in Pennsylvania. So she's the only daughter not living with her mom in that six bedroom home in 2017. Because Helen has moved home from Texas to Virginia, Pam offers to buy her daughter a house in Northern Virginia. 23 year old Helen is like, yeah, Yeah, I mean, I would love a house. So it's in the process of being built. It's new. And Helen and Carlos are getting serious, like I said. But according to her older sister, Megan, their mom, Pam, doesn't approve of this relationship. By the summer of 2017, two adult daughters, one in her 30s and one in her 20s, like I said, have moved back home with their mom and Megan's seven year old daughter. And although this situation is kind of temporary because Helen is maybe eventually going to get married and move out. And of course, Megan is married and might move out with her husband. um, It's not hard to imagine that perhaps tensions start to flare with these new living arrangements. I mean, they're all adults living under the same roof. And this is a pretty big transition for everyone. So now you're all caught up and that takes us to July 14th, 2017. This is sometime between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. A 911 operator in Fairfax County receives a call from someone claiming that they're calling from out of state and that they have information that someone might be in danger at the Hargan household. However, the caller doesn't know the Hargan's exact address. The 911 dispatcher tells the caller to file a report in their home state first and that Fairfax County would then need a teletype of that report before it will respond to the call. So the caller tries 911 again a few minutes later, apparently urgent. This time they have the address for the Hargan household. The caller says that someone has been murdered in the house and someone else is potentially in danger. This second call apparently rouses enough alarm bells for 911 personnel to dispatch police to the Hargan home. Okay, so why wouldn't they the first time? I don't think they thought that there was a true danger going on there. Mm. Um, But no, you're you're completely right. They probably should have just went the first time. Yeah, interesting. I mean, it's hard, but... Yeah. mm -hmm. So shortly after 2 p.m. on July 14th, the police arrive at the Hargan's home on Dean Drive. This is the six-bedroom home where Megan and her daughter, her mom, and Helen are all living. However, when police get there, no one is responding at the house. Officers try multiple times to get an answer, presumably by trying at the doors and windows and by calling, but there's no answer. Officers are getting increasingly worried and they notify the neighbors with a reverse 911 call to stay inside their homes while the police investigate what's going on in there. There are no doors or windows open, so the officers have to force their way into the Hargan house, and they enter the home shortly before 3 p.m. that summer day. Now, please, again, keep in mind, this is a large two-story house with a basement, so there's a lot of ground to cover. The police start by checking the ground floor first, and there, on the first floor, they find a woman's body, and it's Pam Hargan, the mom. Okay. She's face down on the floor of the laundry room. Her body, or at least her head, is covered or wrapped in a blanket. And sitting on top of the blanket is her cell phone. The police see shell casings around her body as she's clearly been shot to death. On even higher alert now, officers go upstairs and this is where they find a second woman's body. Pam's youngest daughter, Helen's body, is upstairs in a bathroom. So... Pam and then Helen. Mm -hmm. She also appears to have been shot to death. She has a massive wound to the head. But that's not all that the police see in the bathroom. They also find the murder weapon. 
Helen is lying on the floor with a rifle wedged between her legs. According to CBS News, the rifle was leaning against Helen's body. The butt was on the floor between her legs. The barrel was pointed up towards the ceiling. Oh, okay. Both women are pronounced dead at the scene. The police search the rest of the house looking for any other victims, but thankfully no one else is at the house. And they immediately start interviewing the neighbors. That's when the police learn that Megan and her young daughter also live in the house, but they're not there. Some of the neighbors don't even know Helen and didn't even realize that Helen, the youngest daughter, had even moved back in with her mom since it had happened that recently. The neighbors are incredibly relieved to find out that the little girl, though, Megan's daughter, isn't there. At the time the bodies are discovered, Megan and her young daughter are actually perfectly safe and sound in a car on their way to their new home in West Virginia. Oh, okay, good. The police notify Steve Hargan, this is Pam's ex-husband, that Pam and Helen have been shot to death in Pam's home. Steve is told that Helen's wound was self-inflicted by okay. the looks of it. So since Steve, the dad, has now been told about the events, he calls the other two daughters, Megan, who lives with Pam and Ashley who lives away from home and they both begin driving to his house in Sterling. Now it's not clear exactly what he tells them or how much information the two receive at this point but either way it seems that both daughters are at the dad's house when the police arrive to interview them all and these interviews are tape recorded by the police. There is a tape of the two girls screaming and wailing when they find out the news about their mom and sister. Oh. Megan is the one who's able to provide the police with the most information because she lived with the both of them. She tells yeah. them that she was there at the house with Pam and Helen earlier that day and she left around 1.30 p.m. She tells police that Helen and their mom had been arguing that day. And as quoted by CBS News and according to the police tape, Megan says, Helen has been so angry, just angry all the time, struggling emotionally. I knew she was depressed, but not like this. I just can't wrap my head around it. She and Ashley both tell police that Helen had talked about hurting herself at least once during the past. So at some point in the past, mm -hmm. Megan then tells police that their mom didn't approve of Helen and Carlos's relationship and their mom didn't want him moving into the house that she was currently building for 23 year old Helen. Got it. According to CBS News, Megan says this morning, my mom let Helen know that she was canceling the contract on the house she's building her because she truly believed that Helen was going to try to move Carlos into the house and my mom didn't want him being there. So she says Helen that morning was told that she's no longer getting a house. Megan also says that their mom and Helen were arguing over Helen's drug use. Apparently, other family members confirmed that Pam was worried about Helen using drugs. Megan then tells the police something else. She informs them that she'd seen two suspicious men in the neighborhood just the day before. She'd noticed them particularly as she thought they appeared to be casing the neighborhood. Megan says this? Yes. Okay, interesting. I'm sure how it went was the police are like, can you tell us anything? She says, yeah, yeah. she was depressed. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And then they said, have you noticed anything suspicious? And she says, oh, now that you say that, I actually did notice. That, yes, okay. I'm sure that it was kind of led to that. Okay. But either way, um, of course, police begin investigating this as a possible lead, even though they believe that it probably is most likely a murder-suicide. Yeah. But they also want to find out where the murder weapon, a 22 Ruger rifle, came from. Megan is able to tell them that as well. It belongs to Megan's husband, who's mm -hmm. in the military. She and her husband were in the process of buying their own home in West Virginia, and Megan's mom had allowed Megan to store the rifle at the house until they moved into their own home. Megan says that she brought the rifle upstairs for protection just the day before because she was worried about those two men that she'd spotted in the neighborhood. After all, it's three women and one young girl living in the house alone. So she was like, you know, I'm, I'm smart. I have this gun. I thought I would use it to protect myself. So I moved it upstairs. Megan also tells police that just the day before her mom had helped Megan and her husband buy their home. So all of this is like brand new and happening just in these last couple days. So the day goes on and later that evening, the police publicly announced that there doesn't appear to be any threat to public safety. This is what police say when they're pretty confident that they're dealing with a murder suicide. suicide. Yeah. Ashley, however, gets a strange and disturbing phone call that night. It's from Carlos. This is Helen's boyfriend. He says he's calling from Texas, and he reveals that he's the one who made the 911 call that day. So Carlos, Helen's boyfriend who lives what? in Texas, is the one 
who called 911 that day. First of all, why would he call and say that? To Ashley. Yeah, the sister to who Ashley, lives. not even to... Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Well, this is why she's shaken. He calls, he says he's heartbroken, and he's also scared. And I'm sure she's like, how did you know that there had been yeah. a murder? Oh, she was on the phone. He was on the phone with her, wasn't he? Carlos tells Ashley that at around 1130 that morning, Helen had called him on her cell phone. Remember, her cell phone was found yep. near her body. He says that he's still living in Dallas, Texas, where he and Helen first met, and he's more than a thousand miles away at this point. Helen is calling him to say that Megan, her older sister, had just murdered her mom. Okay. She's sobbing on the phone. She's frightened, but she tells Carlos to stay calm and quiet. Helen says that Megan came into her room to announce that she just shot their mother and that then Megan went downstairs and is busy on the computer trying to transfer money from their mother's accounts. And that's while Helen is like quietly calling Carlos. Now, according to the Daily Mail, Megan also tells Helen, which she repeats to Carlos during the phone call that morning, that their mom had caught her doing an escort deal and that she was afraid her mom was going to try to take her daughter away from her. So Carlos tells Helen to call 911. He's like, well, if your sister just shot your mom, you need to call 911 and leave the house immediately. But Helen refuses. She mentions that her young niece, Megan's daughter, is still in the house and she doesn't want to leave without her. She's not sure how to get her niece to safety. According to Carlos, by 1.15 p.m., Helen had stopped answering her phone. So Carlos keeps trying to reach her. He keeps calling. And according to one source, Megan actually answers her phone at one point. Mm. And Carlos either talks to her or receives a text from the phone saying, everything is fine. I'm not mad at Megan. So she's Someone's pretending to be Helen. So just to confirm, Megan came down to Helen, basically said, look, I shot my mom. I shot our mom. Yeah. And then after that, she went and called Carlos, correct? Yes. Okay. While her sister Megan is supposedly on the computer trying to transfer money from her mom's account, her now dead mom's account, to her account. That's weird. And Carlos is saying, call 911. And she's saying, I can't. I don't want to leave the house. I don't want to put my niece, who's still in the house, in danger. So not long after 1.15 p.m., Carlos decides to call an emergency number for Fairfax County, Virginia, which is the correct jurisdiction, and reports that he thinks his girlfriend's life is in danger and that he thinks someone might already be dead at their house. He's saying his girlfriend won't answer the phone. However, Carlos gets the runaround from the 911 person on the phone. Obviously, Carlos doesn't have the Hargan's home address like we talked about. So rather than responding to the scene that he's describing as an emergency life or death situation, they're trying to get him to follow a very complicated procedure. Um, so again, he calls back 15 minutes later with the address. And in the second call, he mentions that Helen had told him that her sister, Megan, had killed their mom. Okay. So that's on the 911 phone, the second 911 uh -huh. call. And on the call, 911 operator goes, okay, well, this was out of the blue. Your girlfriend is just sitting in a house with a dead woman. Yeah. And Carlos is like, yes, but I want you to go make sure that my girlfriend's okay because now she's not answering the phone. Okay. So now let's go back to police come, sisters go to dad's house, and then Ashley gets this call from Carlos. And Carlos calls and says, no, 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 this is not a murder-suicide. Megan killed yeah. your mom and your sister. And Ashley refuses to believe it. He's like, absolutely not. Megan did not do this. She would never do that. Megan's friends are interviewed as well, and they all agree. Megan would never do this. Megan would not do an escort deal. She wouldn't kill our mom. The gun was found in Helen. We know Helen was depressed. We know that she has tried Which to is commit funny because Helen literally called Carlos and said, Megan just killed our mom. Well, according to Carlos. True. I guess that's true. I don't know, man. I believe Carlos. You know okay. what I'm saying? Then believe Carlos. All right, let's keep it going. Let's hear so lead homicide detective Brian Byerson and crime scene detective Julia Elliott are quickly assigned to the case. And the detectives are on the scene and planning to stay at the house all night investigating. And they also set up a tip line. 
By 6.20 a.m. the following morning, this is July 15th, 2017, the news media is reporting that the police have identified the bodies as Pam and Helen. The police announced to the public that this was a murder-suicide. They released the following statement. Detectives working through the night have now determined the identities as well as the sequence of events leading to their deaths. They tell the public that 23-year-old Helen shot her mother, Pam, and then shot herself. And they want to reassure neighbors that the seven-year-old child who lived at the home was not home at the time of the incident and she's safe with her mother. Also, all of the family dogs have been accounted for. I just had to include that. But not everything in the police's public statement will necessarily turn out to be true. So what is like, at this point, what are Megan and Ashley talking about, you know? Yeah, like has Ashley told Megan that Carlos called her and said she did it? Like, yeah, is Megan just like making up an entire story? Like what's... Or is Megan telling the truth? Or what's happening? Yeah, that's true too. I don't know. I'm I'm a firm believer in Carlos at the moment. You're not the only one because the detectives feel like maybe the officers spoke to the public too soon. Just that there are several things about this whole thing that just don't seem right to them. The detectives don't want to immediately accept the murder-suicide theory without doing good police work and without conducting a complete and full investigation. And given Carlos's story about the phone call he received from Helen, and given that Megan had been in the house that day, the detectives decide to test Megan's hands for gunshot residue. Okay. And crime scene detective Elliot carefully combs through the house looking for evidence as this is being done. So one thing about the crime scene that kind of bothers them is Pam and Helen were found with a lot of blood. There was a lot of blood all over them. Um, But the rifle is found relatively blood-free. Because she obviously cleaned it off before she put it where she needed to put it. If Helen actually used the rifle on herself, Mm -hmm. there probably would have been blood on it. For sure. Given where it was found, leaning against Helen's body in between her legs, they would have expected blood. Also, all of the shell casings are found in the laundry room. Police obtain a search warrant for the Hargan home at this point, and even though it's a crime scene, it's important to be safe and get a search warrant. The police start scouring the rest of the house for any evidence, and in doing so, they are looking around the house trying to get information on the family, and they come across some photo albums in the basement. And according to CBS News, tucked away in the album of family photos was something that seemed out of place. Documents, Megan's bank statement, Pam's too, and a spreadsheet full of passwords and a security verification details to unlock all of Pam Hargan's bank accounts. It's just like found stuffed inside this photo album. Mm. The scope of the search warrant doesn't include obtaining financial documents, so the police don't have the authority to seize these. They do, however, take photographs of the documents and then put them back in the photo album. Later that day, after the shootings, um, this is July 15th, control of the house is given back to the Hargan family. The police can't just seal the house off and not allow anyone to enter it indefinitely as it's a home that people still live in. The autopsies are also performed on July 15th and the results come back the same day and they reveal together the two women were shot a total of five times. Furthermore, Helen's autopsy reveals something highly unexpected. Helen was shot in the top of her head, not in her chin. So when they originally looked at the wound, they were like, oh, she put it under her chin now they're like that's the exit wound so a hundred percent she did not commit suicide right the bullet went downward not upward now detectives have never come across anyone who shot themselves with a rifle in the top of their own head and they don't even think it's possible like you said so they conclude based on this that helen did not pull the trigger which means this case was not a murder suicide despite the fact that they've already announced that to the public and they now believe they're dealing with a double murder Now, on Monday, July 17th, Capital One Bank reaches out to the detectives on the case with some interesting information. The bank employees have, of course, heard about Pam's murder, and they feel they should report some suspicious activity on Pam's bank accounts just in case it's somehow connected to her murder. The bank tells police that Pam had called them on July 13th, the day before the murder, asking to do a wire transfer in the amount of $400,000. Whoa. This wire transfer is going from her account to a real estate company in West Virginia. Now, if you remember, West Virginia is where Megan is moving with her husband. This is where she's buying a house. 
The caller answered all of the security questions correctly. However, there was some kind of mix up and the transfer doesn't go through. So Pam called again on July 14th, the day of the murders. She said the wire transfer needed to go through that day and that the real estate company needed those funds right away. The bank explains to police that they called Pam back to verify and that Pam denied making any of these calls. So the bank then froze the funds after speaking with Pam. Okay. That means someone was impersonating Pam on the phone, but answered all of the questions correctly. At this point, police decide to call Megan and ask to interview her again, which I'm kind of like, okay, Carlos literally said on the 911 call that it was Megan and it's now taking you four days. I know that you have to yeah. be fair, but it's also like in the 911 call, you had the name of the suspect. If four days is pretty good though. They're moving pretty dang fast on the investigation. Sure. But I'm just kind of annoyed. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Because if she was the husband, he would probably already True. Be, be. But I mean, statistically, that's just how it is. I mean, men are right. more likely to right. kill right. someone than a woman is. So. so Megan comes in. She talks about Helen's depression again. And she talks about the two strange men in the mm -hmm. neighborhood. I knew Carlos was right. He, My man. So I knew he was right. Police are like, hey, we've investigated the... The strange men and we found no other tips from anyone else who saw them no evidence that those men were even there megan also says something about the wire transfers being a mix-up at the bank and that there were nothing suspicious so when mm. they confront her about that she's like no 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 that was just a mix-up like the bank just messed up it was weird so on july 19th 2017 megan tells police she wants to come in for an update on the case because they let her go after that interview and detectives invite her in to the police station she goes in and she talks and she talks she's there for more than four hours oh my god and megan insists it was her mom who called the bank to make those wire transfers she's like okay no now i'm telling you those wire transfers were my mom but you know how whenever you're on the phone and the message says that your call may be recorded oh, for quality no. assurance? Well, the bank the bank was recording these calls like they do. And the bank still has the tapes of these phone no calls. No way. I didn't even think about that. And the police now have the tapes and they play them for Megan. And who do you think's voice is pretending Megan's. to be Pam? And oh. now it's happening right in front of her. Jeez. And so then she has to openly admit to police, okay, actually, I am the one that made those calls because now you're playing them right in front of me. She says she lied about it because she thought it would look bad that she'd been impersonating her mom right before her mom was shot. Megan insists, however, but I haven't killed anyone. Oddly, though, without actually confessing to the murders, Megan begins telling the police that they can blame her. She goes, just blame me. My family's been through enough. Just blame me so they can move on from this, okay? She reportedly fails the polygraph three times. Which, I don't know, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, it does, but as we know, it doesn't in court. Well, for police, to an extent. they're thinking, okay, I'm pretty pretty certain that Megan was the killer. Yeah. Like, she impersonated her at the bank the day before. We have the tapes, and now she's coming and acting all weird. It, it's also kind of weird. She goes, just blame me. Like, it's a game. Like, no. You're going to get like charged they're, they're for, playing clue. for murder. Yeah. Yeah. Like, just blame me and then you guys can win. And although they have Carlos on tape saying, no, literally the victim, Helen, called me and told me that Megan did this, they need to build their case. So they let Megan walk out of this interview. Mm. The need to make sure that the county's attorney's office says there's a strong enough case against Megan in order to proceed with an arrest. So they decide to actually get a warrant for another search on the home and during this search they find those financial documents are no longer in the photo album down in the basement someone with access to the house had removed them discovering this the investigation continues and police are assembling forensic evidence the stronger the forensics the stronger their case will be obviously and the dna results come back on the rifle there is no dna from megan on the rifle okay. Confusingly, DNA is found on the trigger that doesn't belong to Megan or to Helen, though. The lab does find Helen's DNA on the rifle case. Detective Byerson tells CBS News that Helen's DNA was only found on the rifle's case handles, not on the rifle itself, which makes law enforcement believe that Helen hadn't actually touched the rifle that day, had just probably touched it while it was in the home. No usable fingerprints were ever found on the rifle. Okay. 
As for Helen's cell phone, it was found on the bathroom counter not far from her body. The crime lab finds that it has very little blood on it and no fingerprints. But law enforcement can't help but wonder why aren't Helen's prints on her own phone? Like, had it been wiped down? Oh, yeah, for sure. I would assume. Uh, yes. And it, this is a smartphone. Like, it's a glass screen. Yeah. Detectives think it's suspicious that the that Helen's prints aren't on the phone, even though she was using it shortly before she was shot, according to Carlos. Now, while all of this is happening, Megan and her husband qualify for a loan, and they buy a different home in West Virginia, and they move away, and they're living in West Virginia with their daughter. Now, detectives watch Megan month after month, and they continue to amass the physical evidence for over a year. One piece of evidence is that Megan did have gunshot residue on both of her hands. By November 15th, 2017, news reports are coming out based on newly released information that this may have not been a murder-suicide and was probably a double murder. Law enforcement is releasing information that has previously been sealed in the search warrant applications, and the public learns that the search warrant also indicated that someone tried to fraudulently wire money out of Pam's account both on the day before and the day of the murder. So now the public are learning that all is not what it seems. A year later, 16 months since the two women were found shot to death in their home, prosecutors feel they have enough. Megan is indicted by a grand jury on two counts of first-degree murder and two counts of using a firearm. At 7.40 a.m. the next day, this would be November 9th, 2018, Megan, who is now 35, is arrested for murdering her mother and her sister. I wonder what her husband thought this entire time. Just assume... She didn't do it. I guess. Same with Ashley. She just assumed. Yeah. At what point does Ashley's mind change or did it ever? I know. Police search her home and there they make a big discovery. That sheet of paper that went missing from the photo album. Was there. Yep. It's the piece of paper with the list of passwords to all of Pam's accounts. Remember the one that mm-hmm. went missing? Remember how Megan somehow had all of this information on the bank calls? Yep. Megan is arraigned and pleads not guilty. However, along with the rest of the world, her trial is delayed because of COVID-19. In March of 2022, nearly five years after the shootings, the murder case against Megan finally proceeds to trial. And it lasts three weeks. The theory is that Megan wanted to buy a house so badly that she was willing to steal $400,000 from her mother. And then when that didn't work, she killed her for the money. Oh my gosh. And then the prosecution also states in its opening that another motive was Megan's jealousy of her younger sister, Helen, and the fact that mom was buying Helen a house and not her. Um, There's also the theory that Megan figures out that Helen called Carlos. And so now she feels like she has to get rid of Helen. Obviously, how do you kill your own mom and then your own sister as well? Right. Oh, that's insane. Carlos obviously testifies, says, no, Helen told me herself that Megan had just killed her mother and he had tried to tell police he called 911. So you asked about Ashley and I will say, although she doesn't like come right out and say it at the trial, she does testify on behalf of the prosecution to try to get a conviction against Mm. her sister, Megan. So I would say she now is no longer team Megan. Yeah. And finally, on March 24th, 2022, the case goes to the jury. And after deliberating for less than two days, on Monday, March 28th, the jury convicts Megan Hargan of two counts of first-degree murder and two counts of using a firearm. Now, after the verdict, as is common in a big case, the defense investigates what happened during those jury deliberations. So after... A, gui- or a guilty or non-guilty comes out, the defense team will go in and say, okay, well, why? Like, yeah. what happened in the jury room? Why did you vote the way you did? And during this, they find out that one of the jurors went home and used her own rifle to see if Helen could have shot herself in the way the defense claims she did. This juror tried to reenact this scenario to see if it was possible for Helen to have used her toe to pull the trigger of the 22 rifle to shoot herself in the chin like they said she did. The juror concluded that it was impossible. Is that the, allowed? No. You can't do that? No. And the juror then went and shared the results of this oh, with all no. of the other jurors. Don't telling them, tell me she's out of jail. Well, because of all of this, the judge grants the defense motion to vacate the conviction because of juror misconduct. 
wow. because they broke the rules. Okay. So can you retrial? Well, she's still in custody, but a new trial date has not yet been set. Oh, so she is in jail. She currently. is in custody, yes, but they're just waiting for another trial. So she's going to have to be tried I'm again. surprised she's not out on, surprised she's not out or just like on home arrest or something because it's been, right. I mean, it's been vacated. I'm going to assume because it only got thrown out just because of juror misconduct. Yeah. I mean. Which, I mean, feels like it's kind of a big deal, but- it's interesting you can't do that because they were seeing if it's possible. It wasn't possible, so there we go. It was her, right? I it's mean, more know. like the prosecution should have maybe answered that question for them at trial so she didn't have to go home and do it by That's herself. That's true. Uh-huh. Um, but also, what if it was possible and then the prosecution is like, oh, shoot, yeah, it is possible. True. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the aftermath of this is Megan and her husband have since divorced and their daughter is living with her father in a different state. Yeah, I was going to ask about the husband as well. I mean, that it tore so many people apart. Yeah. Ruined so many lives. A year after the murders, the house is sold, according to Redfin. The house yeah. is resold. And like I said, she remains in custody um, and she still to this day says she's innocent. So I'll keep you guys posted on any new developments in this case if we ever hear an update. In the midst of all these legal maneuverings, though, let's please not forget the victims here. Pamela Hargan and Helen Hargan were two amazing, lovely women who were accomplished and who were dearly loved and respected by their friends and family. So let's please remember them today as we wait to hear if there's ever any updates. And that is the case of the Hargan family. Oh, it's crazy what money can do. I know. Right? Because you would probably, like Ashley, you'd probably think, like, my sister, this girl could never do something like that. Yeah. And then, I don't know, I guess money can just drive you to do something insane. Well, that's why I started the case out the way I did and saying the statistics are this probably, this is a lot more common than we think it is. And again... Yeah. It usually is domestic violence situation. Yeah. But you never think it's going to be you. You always think it's going to be another family. Yeah. It's always so surprising when it does happen. Crazy. All right. That is our case. And we will see you next week with another episode. I love it. And I hate it. Goodbye. <laughs>